Welcome everyone. My name is Jenny Parks. You have tuned in, signed in to Building OER Capacity in the Midwest, supporting grassroots efforts and statewide collaboration. I'm joined today by my collaborators, Annika Manny, Jennifer Zent, and Katie Zabak. They will each give you a little bit of an introduction about themselves as they um, jump in to help <clears throat> in hosting this uh, slide presentation. So welcome. Next slide. So MEC, for those of you who don't know us, is um, an acronym for the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. We are one of the four regional compacts in the US serving higher education. Um, the others are WICHE, SREB, and NEBI, for those of you who are more familiar with them. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, the four compacts have gotten together and received a Hewlett grant to do 18 months of work for um, capacity building in OER in our state with a specific emphasis on increasing educational access and equity. We all have the same outcomes for this grant, which we, we have a, a loose affiliation called the National Consortium for Open Educational Resources or NCOER. And if you want to tune in on Wednesday, we're doing a presentation specific to that collaboration. But if you look at this slide, you'll see the practices on the left are in, I mean, the, the outcomes are in bold. That's what we all share. And then if you look at those on the right, you'll see some of the specific outcomes that MEC is hoping to achieve with its work. Each of the compacts is doing things a little bit differently. Next slide, please. So specific to MEC, we do have a number of areas in which we are conducting activities, hoping to achieve our outcomes. One of the big things that we've been doing for three years now that um, is kind of unique to MEC, but I think the other um, regions are also kind of looking at something similar, is to work with OER state action teams. We try to get a group of individuals together in each state to create an OER identity in the state. We've been doing that, like I said, since um, we started in the fall of 2018 with a convening that was region-wide and which Hewlett Foundation also supported. Those um, um, teams keep meeting and keep building community and capacity in each of their states. We try really hard to have all, um, members of all sectors of the higher ed community. We also try to have the K-12 community, the public libraries, and, and as many um, diversified partners as we can so that we can create a new culture of open education and open educational resources in each of our state. We also have a couple of research projects that, in which we are engaged. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about them today um, from the principal researchers in both of those. Uh, we've also been supporting virtual convenings in each of our, or virtual leadership um, activities in each of our states. So we have collaborated there with the Open Education Network for those leadership trainings. This would be for um, um, <clears throat> institutional and systems uh, leaders. And then we've been helping a few of our states actually launch their first OER statewide summits. Um, we also have been trying to work with uh, Rebus Foundation to um, help CTE practitioners develop some new resources across the region. We've had a number of webinars. You can go to the MAC um, OER page or to the we MAC webinar page, and you'll be able to find many of those webinars already recorded and put there for you. And we do have an OER technology working group where we're trying really hard to build an understanding of the technologies that touch OERs and the, um, the technology that yet needs to, needs to be developed and to develop that marketplace and that understanding so that we can keep moving forward with those types of innovations. Next slide. So one of the things that it's important for us to say that we've been doing um, in uh, MEC, like I said, we have um, our OER action team is really our, our unique thing. Um, we have representatives from public universities and um, many from private universities too. They meet quarterly with um, um, phone calls that we all share, but then there's a lot of contact between that time. And they are also the folks on whom we, we um, draw upon to schedule our leadership events, but also to schedule um, our summits. In January, 2021, we asked each state to complete a, capa a capacity assessment. We're really trying to figure out what are the precursors, the preconditions that are needed in a state to really help it build from the from the ground up an OER infrastructure, culture, and set of practices. So I'm gonna let turn this over to Annika now. She's gonna tell you a little bit more about that assessment and what we hope to learn from it. Thanks, Jenny. 
Um, yeah, so as Jenny mentioned, we developed a state capacity assessment, um, which of course we're happy to share with folks as part of the resources for this session. Um, and the assessment covered um, four main areas. The first two um, are related to state policy and advocacy. And what we asked each state to do was to sit down with their OER action team and sort of answer these questions. So do we have legislation in our state yet? Um, do we have a legislator who is knowledgeable and maybe passionate about OER that we can depend on? Um, and for each of these items um, under all these categories, they sort of said yes, no, or it's in progress. And then um, took some time to write some notes on, on where they were at with each of these things. Um, so under state policy and advocacy, it's really around um, legislation and support from the state government. Under institutional commitment, we ask people to think about um, who all is engaged in OER across the state. Um, does the university and college system have an OER initiative? Does the community college system have one? How about our independent institutions? What about our K-12 folks? How are we engaging um, you know, across um, the P-20 spectrum? Um, how about our library association or library system? And what about our student organizations? So we want folks to really think about each of these categories and think about whether um, they have folks engaged at each of these levels around OER. And if so, are we, um, are we working together uh, effectively so that we can um, really improve outcomes for students? The second two categories on the state capacity assessment uh, relate to communications and infrastructure and strategic planning. So here again, people are asked to self-assess um, where are we at as a state? Um, have we put together a website around open education? Um, do we maybe have a repository? Um, I think I saw Mindy earlier. So then a lot of folks have been using OER Commons to um, create a, a repositories and hubs for um, listing out their OER. Um, that's a great way to communicate what's available across the state. Um, is there an annual event like a summit? Um, can you say, can you look around and say, here's the people that are here, here's the people that are not here, and, and come up with a plan to engage those folks that are not yet engaged around OER? What about data and metrics? What are we doing to collect data around um, what we're doing? And Katie's going to talk a little bit later about what some of those data might look like, uh, especially related to cost savings and other return on investment. And then um, do we have, do we get together regularly? Um, and present out to our constituencies and our stakeholders across the state. And then for strategic planning, um, a lot of our states have been working on developing their own vision and mission statements around open education. So what are we hoping for as a state to achieve with this? Um, each of the state OER action teams have started to articulate roles and responsibilities towards achieving that, that mission and vision. Um, and we ask our, we've asked our states to, to think together about what are some three goals you think you could um, achieve in the next six months um, and really spend some time thinking about what's achievable and what can we do together. Um, and then finally, we ask folks to think a little bit about what do you need to move your work forward? So what kinds of resources do you need? Maybe that's from MEC, maybe that's from the state, maybe it's from your system or your institution or helping um, people come together and really identifying what they need um, in order to build that capacity. So I'd love to hear from the folks here and I see there's a couple little blips in the chat, which I haven't read yet. Um, but, oh, and yes, Sue, you can totally join us in Illinois and Elizabeth too. We would love to have everybody. Um, I'd love to know from you all, you know, do these kinds of things resonate in terms of building capacity within the state? And are there things that we're missing here? Are there th other indicators of, of capacity that you think we should include here? Feel free to uh, put your thoughts in the chat and I'll give everyone a minute to do that. What else could we be including? And I'll flip back to the first. Professional development, that's a great, that's a great one. Yeah, we talk about um, in infrastructure and communications having like annual events and stuff, but we, we didn't talk specifically about um, other kinds of professional development. So I think that would be great. Um, 
Yeah, and Rebel, absolutely, you can share. Um, we will upload um, a copy of this assessment to um, Sketch after the conference today so that you can actually download them. Thanks, Jonathan, great thought. Yeah, we, we've been trying to work across the state um, and sometimes that engages um, with state systems, but we've also been engaging outside of those systems and trying to bring different systems together. So in a lot of states, we have community colleges that are in a separate system from the public um, four years, which are in some often a separate system from independent colleges. So we've been trying very much to try to bring people together. The way that they're defining OER, that's really great. Thank you for the, those thoughts. Yeah, and thanks, Mindy. Yeah, professional learning is great. I think that's a great um, suggestion for us to call that out more specifically. All right, we're limited in time. I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Um, if there's any folks here, like our colleagues in Illinois that wanna engage with the Illinois State team, um, just send me a note and I will get you onto that team. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass this off to uh, Jennifer now. Thank you so much. And thanks you all for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Zinth and I'm founder principal of a consulting firm based here in Denver, Colorado, Zinth Consulting. And just a little background about myself. Uh, for about 20 years, I was uh, at Education Commission of the States, a 50 state organization serving state policymakers across row groups across the 50 states and dual enrollment for probably the last 10 or 12 years I was there was the number one topic that I fielded. I covered a number of issues on high school to post-secondary transitions, as well as um, STEM and computer science, but from state demand um, from our constituents, dual enrollment was the topic that I did the most work on. In 2019, I left to start my own consulting business, continuing to work with states, nonprofit organizations, um, also some foundations on this work. So I'm delighted to be here today. Next slide, please. So just a quick point of clarification, um, in my comments today and in the report, we use the term dual enrollment as an umbrella term for college courses offered to high school students, regardless of the course location, instructor type, or course modality. And this report is really intended for multiple stakeholders uh, on the OER side, state and local K-12 and post-secondary OER stakeholders, as well as dual enrollment stakeholders, again, coming from either the state or local level, both from K-12 and post-secondary. And this could be for um, those who haven't yet thought about the use of OER and dual enrollment, or who have begun using OER and dual enrollment courses, but are looking to take their efforts to the next level. And so the, um, out, the intended outcome of this report is to inform these stakeholders and state policymakers in general on the potential challenges to equitable dual enrollment program access participation success and the, and the cost of the traditional textbooks, how these can be barriers, how OER can mitigate those challenges. Um, the current state policy landscape in terms of who's responsible for covering dual enrollment textbook costs and a sort of how to for integrating OER into dual enrollment courses or taking OER integration and dual enrollment to the next level. Next slide, please. And so before we dive in on, I just want to share a word about how using non-OER textbooks and dual enrollment programs can potentially negatively impact equitable course access and student participation. And a number of states have uh, two or more dual enrollment programs. And so even within the same state, the entity responsible for covering dual enrollment textbook costs can vary. So for example, in a state where a post-secondary institution may receive a, stall, a small amount from the state, uh, that amount might be responsible for covering not just the cost of tuition, but also fees, textbooks, any course materials as applicable. And so an institution might be disinclined to offer courses with high textbook costs if they have to cover all of those types of expenses uh, with an amount of money that may be even less than they would get for tuition alone for a regularly matriculated student. And so um, an institution may pull back on offering courses to high school students that are some STEM courses uh, that have high textbook costs than most uh, liberal arts courses, or uh, some CTE courses that may have high course material costs. For example, photography, welding, or culinary arts courses where each student has to have their own knife set. They might say, you know, the textbook doesn't cost that much for that culinary course, but 
you have to cover the knives as well. So maybe we're going to have limited slots for high school students or just not offer that course um, to high school students. Alternatively, where the district has to cover textbook costs for dual enrollment courses, um, the district similarly may want to scale back the number of dual enrollment courses they offer, the types of courses, or the number of seats in some courses, again, to rein in textbook costs. And this could be particularly common in other resource school districts or rural districts that are experiencing declining enrollment and having to make difficult decisions on staffing um, facilities, all sorts of other issues in addition to uh, dual enrollment costs, including textbook costs. So alternatively, um, if a district has to cover their textbook costs, the district may tell students not to take home their dual enrollment textbooks for fear that students will lose them or they might be damaged, or they might tell students not to write in their textbooks um, so that the same textbook can be used in the same course offering in a subsequent academic term. As you can imagine, um, both of these practices might negatively impact student learning and student performance in the course, which is going to be on their permanent uh, student transcript. Next slide, please. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, going back to intended outcomes. So um, informing uh, state and local policy or stakeholders on the benefits, best practices, uh, state policies. Next slide, please. And so to research this report, um, I first looked at um, dual enrollment textbook policies in the 50 states and District of Columbia. And in dual enrollment, I used to call updating this 50 state resource as playing whack-a-mole because it could be in a single state, it could be in statute, it could be an appropriations bill, it could be in uh, state board K-12 regulations, higher education board regulations, and a policy document that sits outside of regulations. Um, but I looked across a number of places in the states and as needed, um, clarified um, practices with um, state K-12 or higher education agency staff. I conducted interviews in early 2021 um, reaching out to folks who responded to a request for interviews on listers operated by the Open Education Network, SREB, and MEC. And in the SREB states, um, southern states, um, per SREB's preference, those were more focused on state or system level OER initiatives. And in the MEC states, um, we looked more at um, institution level initiatives. And we included um, call, a couple of interviews in Colorado. Um, they are under the same post secondary regional accreditor as um, Midwestern states and are experiencing some similar challenges uh, related to um, dual enrollment as part of their accreditation. So it was a total of 11 remote interviews conducted with a total of 19 state and local stakeholders. And you can see here the variety of stakeholders um, I talked to in those interviews. Next slide, please. And so looking now at the uh, uh, state policies on who pays for dual enrollment textbooks. Uh, this adds up to more than uh, 51 because, as I mentioned earlier, in some states there may be two or more um, entities responsible depending upon the program, the post secondary institution type. For example, in one state, uh, if a student takes a course through community colleges, um, it's one funding model, but if a student takes a course through the four institutions, it's a different funding model. Or again, just depending on the type of high school that a student attends, public, non-public, or homeschool, um, there may be different entities responsible for those textbook costs. Now, as you can see here, in three states, um, the state was responsible for covering textbook costs. In seven states, it was the school district or the high school or secondary school. Um, in one state, the post-secondary institution, uh, independent of state aid, was partly responsible for covering those costs. In 13 states, um, it was the student. Uh, in 16 states, it was the state policy required that the local agreement between the K-12 and post-secondary partner specified if the K-12 partner was covering the cost, the student or parent, if the post-secondary partner or some combination thereof was covering textbook costs. And then the largest number of states, 20 states plus the District of Columbia policy was completely silent. There was no mention anywhere of uh, which entity was responsible for covering textbook costs. And so in practice, it's something that's locally determined between the K-12 and post-secondary partner. And as you might imagine, um, in those states where policy is silent or it's a local decision, there's the greatest potential for inequitable dual enrollment access um, between districts or even uh, within a district. Uh, if, if the high school is making the um, contract or agreement directly with the post-secondary partner. So you could have a student in district A where the family is paying nothing, the textbook cost is completely covered by another entity and the next district over, 
students and their families are fully responsible for textbook costs. Next slide, please. So um, looking at the institutions, um, we, I, we have a lot of interesting uh, findings here. I'm the kind of person where if I've done a report, I hate to just regurgitate information from the report. I like to include a few interesting tidbits that weren't covered in the report. Um, but looking here, um, commonalities that we heard across multiple interviews were uh, that's really critical for a uh, course, for a uh, faculty to approve the learning outcomes first for the course, and then um, develop the OER or approve OER. Or if the institution is updating its learning outcomes, make sure that, that update takes place before faculty dive in and begin um, modifying the OER or approving an OER. Another key finding that we heard in multiple interviews was the real need to explain to faculty, um, department chairs, um, even institutional leadership, the why behind the what, um, what the benefits are um, to all different types of stakeholders, also students, and the benefits of uh, faculty's ability to customize their content to either specific student populations or um, specific learning outcomes or faculty preferences. And a couple of really interesting examples came through in interviews in Colorado. One of them was a story about a business law professor who was dissatisfied with all the business law textbooks out there because they didn't quite fit the course that she had designed. And so she had the capacity to enhance academic freedom by developing her own course materials. And she actually co-wrote the textbook with her students, but also pulled in some guest contributors from her time as a lawyer. So legal authorities, judges, and so forth. And so the resulting OER business law textbook, um, she found that the course had actually become more rigorous um, by using this textbook. And at the same time, students experienced higher levels of engagement with the material, as well as higher levels of academic performance. Another interesting example was from uh, Colorado State University's Pueblo campus, which is a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, they're using OER to offer Spanish courses to heritage Spanish speakers who are looking to pursue Spanish in an academic context. And so these students, having spoken Spanish um, from when they were infants, uh, have different learning needs from students who are learning Spanish as a second language. And so one professor developed OER to embrace her students um, experience as Spanish heritage learners. And she, like the law professor, found that using this OER uh, resulted in better student engagement as well as better student outcomes. And one of my favorite quotes, um, which I think it's somebody from who is in this session right now said, I won't say who, um, don't just tell faculty to swim in the ocean. There are so many resources out there that faculty's eyes will roll back in their head if they don't have some sort of guidance or support. And so this person um, urged uh, both folks at the institution level, but also at the state level to make sure that faculty are connected with curriculum developers at their institution, librarians and other types of staff who can support them say, I, I saw your learning outcomes for this course. Here are five options you might pick and choose from uh, to develop an OER that's customized uh, for your course and your preferences. I also heard over and over again, I'm glad to hear um, professional development was mentioned in the responses to Annika's question, but over and over again, I heard in the interviews that high quality professional development and training are just invaluable for faculty as well as high, their high school counterparts. Um, one example came from Baker College in Michigan that uses its Center for Teaching Excellence to put together trainings for faculty, both to help them know how to most effectively use OER but also how to most effectively support students in using OER, along with introducing faculty at the resources that might um, support their, their classroom and, and how to use, make use of those resources. And so the last on the institution interviews um, that I heard multiple times was really importance of sending um, staff and faculty out to state or regional conferences um, to further empower them on local adoption and innovation. And that people commented that things change so quickly in a digital world that these kind of external um, opportunities can help them stay up to date. Um, so one example was in Arapahoe Community College in Colorado, which is the two-year institution in Colorado that offers the most uh, dual enrollment courses statewide. They talked about the value of sending a team to the state's OER ambassador training, which is a train the trainer model, but it also helped uh, faculty effectively message to their peers back on campus the benefits of using OER. Next slide, please. And so looking now at state level interviews, um, 
again, a lot of really interesting findings, but just a few here. It was really interesting that the um, span across states in terms of the um, number of years that some initiatives have been in place. Um, there are some that have been in place for quite a long time, and then some that were just getting off the ground in 2021. I heard from multiple interviewees also that there were fewer um, OER in career technical education, both in terms of full-blown OER courses as well as um, OER resources uh, for CTE um, areas. And that said, um, people mentioned that the multiple um, efforts underway. Um, one was mentioned in Georgia, where the technical college system is interested in developing OER materials, not full-blown OER courses, particularly for early childhood education. The community college system in Colorado was also recently awarded a grant just earlier this year to develop OER for the eight college level courses um, in CTE that have the highest enrollments statewide of high school students. And then um, looking at what can help state efforts, some commonalities across interviews were not just a, a top down approach and not just a grassroots up, but some combination of state level direction and grassroots support many people thought could be particularly helpful. Um, people also commented on the value of focusing the development of OER on the most impactful courses, for example, um, college courses that are general education requirements in the state that are also taken oftentimes by high school students. I did not find in any instances where courses or OER were developed exclusively for use by high school students, but post-secondary faculty may work alongside high school instructors in developing college-level content for courses for high school students. Um, and so interviewees commented on a number of different types of funding sources, but that funding itself was critical. This couldn't be done just on the existing resources that a, an institution might have. Um, they talked about the importance of faculty stipends to cover faculty's time outside their regular um, teaching load to either adapt or update or develop OER, as well as when high school teachers were involved, stipends that might cover their time outside the regular school day or school year. They talked about federal sources, including uh, Perkins grants for developing for or instructor support, um, professional development on using OER for CTE courses. Uh, Louisiana commented that they had a, received a $2 million federal grant from the U.S. Department of Education to support development of OER. Some states uh, mentioned st using state agencies funds. For example, Louisiana previously used it, uh, funds from their boards of regents before they received that federal grant. Um, Texas has had a legislative, legislatively funded competitive grant program for a few years now, but they're also using federal CARES Act dollars for, for OER projects including but not limited to um, for courses offered by high school students. Jennifer, thank, thanks so much. I know you have so much more you want to share, but we're, we're getting a little bit behind on our schedule. I want to make thank sure you. Katie has enough time for her, thank you. for her piece. Thank you so much. Katie, you're thanks, up. Thanks, Jennifer and Annika. My name is Katie Zayback, and I am a um, education consultant with Zayback Consulting. Um, more, mo more recently, uh, I was the director of policy at the Colorado Department of Higher Education, and I've been working with states and systems to uh, implement policy change through data and research for almost the last two decades. So I have just really been um, fortunate um, as part of this project to get to be part of the OER community. Um, and a little bit of background on my project, I'm working um, to work with MEC to create some consistency around cost savings measures in OER and conversations around return on investment. Um, and so when they uh, asked me to do this research, I, I did a quick scan and I said, we don't need more research on this topic. We've got lots out there, but what we do need is we need the experts to come together and tell us the best way to use the research that's already out there. Um, and so the way that we've approached this project is we put together a work group and you can see the members of the work group. Some of them may be here um, today, um, but these are the 13 members of our work group who have just been invaluable in helping to guide this work. Uh, so on the next slide, I'll talk to you about what we're actually doing and then what we define that we do. So we are developing common principles to improve consistency and reliability in the field for measuring cost savings and the return on investment of OER. 
Um, we want the final product to make to be uh, to create that consistency. So we want it to be possible for somebody to create and or replicate an estimate. Whether or not we publish a final number is still up for debate. Um, who is our audience? Our audience is decision makers who define um, resource allocation. So that includes um, many of MECS members, the legislators, the systems heads, um, institutional leadership. Um, we do want our, our research and the report to be accessible to the public and to people who vote for those people who, um, or help get those people into decision-making rules. Um, but ultimately the conversation around cost savings is one around decision-making. And so that's why um, that's our main audience. Um, so on the next slide, um, we are, I, the next slide kind of tells you why we want to do this work and why Mac um, undertook this and one of their projects for, uh, as part of the partnership with Encore. Um, the first thing is that advocates in the OER space of which some of you might be, need a clear and concise statement that articulates and communicates the value of OER. Um, there's lots of things floating out there and we know that cost savings is essential to this conversation and we want to be able to have some consistency around it. Decision makers want a consensus based metric to use or to customize when they are measuring the cost savings and return on investment of OER to students and their organizations. Leaders. Um, need to understand the good work and progress already created to measure the impact of OER um, so that they can use it within their own efforts. Um, and similarly, practitioners have limited time. <laughs> they need short, uh, a shortcut to help them um, be able to talk about the value of open education resources um, and to communicate uh, to the field. And then finally, um, we need uh, some consistency in this space so that we can hold ourselves accountable. Um, and so that we can ensure that OER continues to increase uh, the effectiveness of our efforts in higher education and in higher education attainment. So those are just some of the reasons why this project has been important. Um, with the working group, we define some key questions, which starts with why are the current model or what are the current models of cost savings and return on investment in the research and what are their strengths and the weaknesses? So we've been exploring that. Um, we really wanted a landscape of what's happening in out there in the field. We wanted to understand what are the best practices for states and institutions who are already measuring cost savings and return on investment. I'm sure some of you are in that group. Um, we have had good conversations about the distinction between textbook cost savings or resource cost savings and return on investment. Um, and you'll see on the next slide, we've made a distinction between the two. Um, how are cost savings and return on investment different for the state, the institution and the student? And, and, the student? and you're gonna see some um, of the answers to that questions bear out in the next slide. How and should we define OER when measuring cost savings and return on investment? What is the time horizon for measuring the impact of open education resources? And how do we account for non-monetary costs? Things like faculty and structural changes, and also non-monetary returns. Things like student learning, additional access to resources, increased retention, greater equity. We know all those things are associated with um, open education resources and how do we measure those things. So on the next slide, you'll see kind of the two constructs that we um, hope to talk about in our final report, which we plan to release early next year. Um, the first is an understanding of cost savings. And so there are some really good examples of state level reports that have come out, system level reports that have come out around how much does creating an OER um, save our students overall, either at the individual course level or at the national level. Um, in general, the way that we calculate this is pretty consistent. Um, we often look at the number of sections that have open education resources. This is made easier when states have course marking or systems have course marking. Um, we look at the overall level of enrollment. Sometimes that's specific enrollment. Sometimes that is an estimate of enrollment. 
And then we look at the multiplier and this is what varies the most. That's why it's in red. Um, our multiplier has the tendency to have fluctuation in it. Um, and so that looks at what, what cost savings do students see because of, um, because of an implementation of OER. But there's other important things that our system needs to consider. And that is um, where return on investment comes into play. And as somebody who's trained in policy, I am starting to think about our return on investment conversation as a cost benefit analysis conversation. So what um, are the costs to our state and our institution to invest in OER? And what are the benefits that our states and institutions get um, from implementing OER? And so that's some of the key things that we are um, thinking about as part of this work. And in order to support the, uh, the discussions that will go. Oh, Katie, I think you muted yourself by accident. Oh, sorry. In order to support this work and to put this work in context, we have put together a set of principles that we uh, follow when we're looking at either uh, the cost benefit or the um, cost savings. And so this is our set of working principles that will continue to evolve prior to the report coming out. Um, but the first is based on the fact that all students should have access to the course material that they need. The second is based on the fact that um, open education resources support learning in the same way that commercial and all rights um, reserved materials support learning. Um, we know that from the research. And um, so we that's just a general principle. Um, Good course development requires planning and integrating regard, integrating course material regardless of whether or not that course material is OER. And so we need to think about that when we think about the costs. Um, developing new, new OER resources is not always required. Um, sometimes we're supporting the implementation of those resources, but there's been a lot of development that's happened. And so when we think about costs and assumptions around costs, we need to look at what's already out there. Um, OER has benefits beyond the direct cost savings um, that should be acknowledged. So that's key to our cost benefit um, side of the equation. Consistency is important, but to scale estimates are probably going to be essential. Um, and their estimates are really a valuable tool when we start to look at national cost savings. And then um, you need different levels of specificity for cost savings and return on investment estimates depending, depending on the kind of stakeholder you're working with. So whether you're working with a legislator or as somebody at the, um, at the specific department level at the school, those individuals are gonna need different kinds of information. And so we wanna make sure that we call that out as a principle and we also acknowledge it in this final report. Um, so when you... Thank you Go ahead. so much. I think we only have one minute left in our session today. Um, our time has really flown by. Um, I think we can stay on for questions after the session concludes um, for a few minutes. Um, if we do have some questions, I just wanted to acknowledge that we're, we're just approaching time. So I don't know if you want to just wrap up um, with some of your next steps. Yeah, no, I was going to do the same thing. So thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, very interested to hear folks' feedback on this. Well, thank you, Annika, Jennifer, and Katie. This is Jenny one more time. Thank you all for being here. We did learn some big high-level lessons in the work we've already conducted, and we find it helpful in informing the work we are uh, moving forward with. I don't have time to go over all of them, but if you take a look there, you'll see that they really involve taking people where they are, acknowledging their diversity, and leveraging that to make the movement stronger. And we'll stay on for more questions. Thank you. So 